Welcome to Football Full Circle right here on the Sports Grid Radio and Television Network. Joe Lisi, Rich Sermonello, kicking it around for the next couple of hours. Talking about college football, we'll break down the Big Ten, also talk about the SEC, but news of the week broke on Thursday, Rich. UCLA and USC in 2024 moving to, from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten. Yeah, some early fireworks uh, in this holiday weekend, this 4th of July weekend. Fireworks coming out of Los Angeles, Joe. Uh, unexpected. I think the Pac-12 in general was caught by surprise. This is the first in a number of steps as we move closer to mega conferences uh, in college football. We're going to have uh, something resembling the SEC and the ACC in the future and now Pac-12 and Big Ten. And the question now becomes, uh, what happens with Notre Dame? Uh, is Oregon headed to the Big Ten? Uh, what happens to the Pac-12? Do they join forces with the Big 12? And the biggest question of all for, for me, and, and I'd like your take on it, is is this good for college football? Is it good for college football fans? Is it good for student athletes? I know it's good for the bottom line, but you know, I was left on Thursday right up until now feeling like this isn't progress for those of us who really love the sport. Well, I, th I think the tradition and pageantry is, is basically gone, right? The Rose Bowl type of matchup that we were used to back in the day, Iowa, UCLA, and Michigan and USC, those are gone right now. It's, it's really a top 45 type of playoff with the best teams in the country lobbying and jockeying for position. I don't think it's the end of college football, Rich, for the sense of the regular season games that we're going to be able to witness and watch each and every Saturday are going to be second to none, right? We, we would wait all season long to see maybe Ohio State play US, USC or UCLA, respectively, and we might get this matchup each and every year. We'll get USC on the road in Penn State and Happy Valley, those more key matchups are what really thrive in terms of revenue, dollars, and obviously, uh, you know, TV bottom line sponsorship. So I think that's where we'll gain from, especially from the gambling perspective, the amount of revenue that is going to be gambled each and every Saturday from an in-game perspective most likely will be second to none. I think the bigger question right now with Notre Dame, and you mentioned Oregon, there was a report that just came out, I, I want to say a couple hours ago, that right now the Big Ten is, is expecting both Oregon and Notre Dame to potentially be on board. What does that mean for Washington? What does that mean for other teams? What does that mean basically for Clemson, right? Clemson's a team that has been for years mentioned along with the SEC. They have an arch rival in South Carolina that they play each and every year or potentially not just Notre Dame and Oregon on the move in terms of the Big Ten, but is Clemson and maybe Florida State on the move to the SEC? Yeah, so so much to unpack there. Uh, in Notre Dame, I mean, that's the big ticket for everybody. Everybody wants Notre Dame, the storied tradition, uh, the pageantry, the built-in fan base. Uh, Notre Dame is second to none when it comes to name recognition, not just here in the States, but even globally. Uh, Notre Dame is the one that everybody is looking for. So if the Big Ten can land Notre Dame, that is uh, just an epic addition if that does happen. In terms of the ACC, you know, the Clemsons, the Florida States, even North Carolina, great academic institution, uh, great basketball institution. Uh, you know, I, there are media rights in place until 2035, which could complicate things. It does make it a little bit harder for those schools to leave the ACC at this point. So, yeah, and, and to your initial point, I mean, college football is not going away. The fandom and the attention is not going away. Uh, I, I just really question if this is great for fan bases. Oftentimes, these fan bases wanted to travel to some of these road games going to be a lot more difficult uh, in, in an alliance that has Big Ten schools in Indiana and Maryland and New Jersey uh, is going to be a lot more difficult. And it's going to be a lot more travel, not just for uh, football players and basketball players, the two big sports, but all sports, the volleyball players, the hockey teams. Uh, the Olympic sports, now we're going to have to be traveling in some cases across country. And we are going to lose some rivalries as well. So I, I think, again, bottom line benefits, sport isn't going away. But uh, I do feel like something is going to be missing in college football down the road. 
as we welcome in our radio audience, Joe Lisi, Rich Sermonello, breaking down the latest developments in the Pac-12 with USC and UCLA moving on to the Big Ten in 2024. You're absolutely right, Rich. What does this mean, though, for the college football playoff, right? I mean, I think that maybe four or five years down the road, we won't see maybe the, as top-heavy as we see right now with Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia, Alabama. I think we might have maybe a handful of teams, 10 to 12 teams that are jockeying for a potential national championship that have an, a realistic opportunity to win a national title. And isn't that what it's all about? We know that money drives the bus. We're not talking millions anymore. This deal with USC and UCLA is going to have a residual effect in the billions to Fox and the other TV networks that cover this great sport. Yeah, and just quickly, Joe, before we go to a break, uh, expansion is coming. More teams will be competing for a college football playoff and a national championship. I do think that's one of the positives that's going to come out of uh, this round of expansion in college football. The ever-changing landscape of college football, we just bring it each and every week. When we come back, Rich and I will break down the Big Ten. Keep it where it is. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers and the, the morning Russell after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley comes over there. Give me the game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a four and a In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, yeah, time. In game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The early line. USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten? Yes, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever on the face of it. How could you have two teams on the West Coast playing the Heartland, playing against, you know, in Chicago against Northwestern, or playing Ohio State in Columbus, or going up to Ann Arbor and playing Michigan, or East Lansing with Michigan State? It's going to happen here. Why? Because money dictates here. Only on Sports Grid. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best slips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the Pro Football Doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid.
Back on Football Full Circle, Joe Lisi, Ritz Sermonello breaking down all things college football for the next couple of hours. We talked about the situation with USC and UCLA, respectively. Going to turn our attention to the Big Ten right now. When you look at this conference, in terms of last year, Michigan and Jim Harbaugh were able to step up, dominating Iowa in the Big Ten championship game 42-3. to But when you look at this season, all eyes, Rich, are on Ryan Day in that explosive offense led by Heisman Trophy candidate C.J. Stroud. They opened as a 5-1, to one, basically favored to win the national championship. It's now down to 3-1, to one, right behind Alabama, but they are minus 200 to win the Big Ten this year. I think right now on paper, they are clearly the best offense and most complete team in the conference heading into 2022. Yeah, I, I listen, it's hard to dispute Ohio State right now, the most uh, talented team offensively, clearly. Uh, defense is going to be the big question mark. It's been years since they've had a formidable defense. They bring Jim Knowles, the defensive coordinator, uh, over from Oklahoma State, who did a phenomenal job last year with his 4 2 5 alignment. There are going to be some complexities to this defense, but talent won't be an issue here either. Like, I want to see. Uh, Zach Harrison, does he develop into an All-American caliber type player? Uh, Jack Sawyer, former five-star defensive end, this could be his breakout year. Ronnie Hickman uh, on the last line of defense. They have talent at Ohio State, but five times last year, Joe, uh, Buckeyes allowed more than 30 points. Now, I know they get dragged into shootouts because of the offense, but if they want to be a true national championship contender really take that next step get there with alabama and georgia they're going to need some progress on defense because offensively no one is stopping these guys i i don't know if i see a loss on the regular season schedule i don't see it in that opener against notre dame notre dame is going to be going through a little bit of rebuilding in the first year with marcus freeman so yeah, I, I mean, there's not a lot of value on the board uh, this year in terms of national championship contenders but Five to one looked good. Three to one doesn't look quite as good. But uh, I, I think Ohio State is legit, not just as a Big Ten favorite, but as a national championship contender. Hey, you look at the schedule. You mentioned week one against Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame. They did open as a ten and a half point favorite. They immediately bet it up. In most books here on FanDuel in New Jersey, they're a 14 and a half point favorite. And we'll break down down that game a little bit later uh, in this segment. But when you look at the schedule, Rich, they do get Wisconsin at home. They're on the road in Happy Valley to face off against Penn State. Penn State played them very tough last year. They were a 19.5 point dog the week after they lost a nine overtime game to Brett Bielma and Illinois pushed Ohio State to the limit in the first half. And then Ohio State turned it on to win that ball game by 11 points. But I think when you look at it, as a whole, from an offensive perspective, they are the, the team, right? You mentioned it. There is no team within the conference from an offensive perspective that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with C.J. Stroud and those wide receivers and running back Travion Henderson. The concern is, can that front seven develop and evolve, especially where they were playing at the end of the year? They showed progression because there were holes, especially in run support. Look at week one, where basically they were, they were a 14-point favorite on the road in Minnesota to square off against Tanner Morgan and Mo Ibrahim. Mo Ibrahim had a fantastic day and afternoon on that front seven. If teams can run on Ohio State and sustain ball control type of drives, you can then keep C.J. Stroud on the offense and maybe you can get into a lower scoring game and pull that ball game out. Let's not forget as a 14 and a half point favorite, they lost that matchup to C.J. Verdell and Travis Dye at home in week number three. So there is the potential where if the front seven doesn't develop early, I'm not saying that they lose to Notre Dame, but I think Notre Dame potentially can maybe cover that 14-and-a-half point number week number one, especially with a defensive-minded head coach in Marcus Freeman. Yeah, and that's going to be the blueprint. I, I don't think you're going to outgun Ohio State this year. It, they, they might have – think about this, Joe – they might have the best quarterback in the country, if not one of the two or three best. They might have one of the two or three best running backs. You mentioned Travion Henderson. Mayan Williams, the backup, I, I think would start for half the programs in college football. Uh, and, and in Jackson, Smith, and Jigba probably have the best wide receiver, and they're getting deeper. A lot of those young receivers, Emeka Egbuka, 
uh, Marvin Harrison. The, the receiving core is going to grow up very fast this year for C.J. Stroud. So if you get into a shootout, you're not going to beat Ohio State. So the model that you touched on is is the way to go. You got to grind it out. You got to have long drives. Uh, you got to rush for 200, 250 yards. Wisconsin possibly could do that with Braylon Allen. Uh, and Ohio State always has that game. Once a year, it's kind of like Oklahoma. Once a year, they have that head-scratching performance uh, where they'll drop a game. I don't think that's going to be enough for them not to, to win the Big Ten because the conference after Ohio State, you know, Michigan was fantastic last year, breakout year for Jim Harbaugh, win the Big Ten championship. I don't see that team in the Big Ten. Michigan's going to take a step backwards. Uh, Big Ten West is deep. You've got a lot of good teams like Wisconsin, like Minnesota, like Iowa. Uh, I don't think there's a great team to compete uh, uh, with uh, Ohio State. So even if the Buckeyes stumble along the way, at worst, I think this is an 11-1 regular season, Big Ten championship, and, and, and back to the college football playoff. Do you think it would be a disappointment for Ryan Day the way they ended last year, right? 48-45 over Kyle Whittingham and a very gutty Utah team, but not really where they wanted to be in terms of going to the Rose Bowl. This team is built for a college football playoff appearance. So is it playoffs or bust right now for Ryan Day? And we mentioned maybe potential slip-ups. We saw that with Urban Meyer a few years ago, right, where they got blown out in West Lafayette by Jeff Brom and Purdue I look at two maybe games on the docket. October 22nd against Iowa, even though Iowa does come to Columbus, that's never an easy game. Iowa has shown the ability to to knock off the Ohio State Buckeyes uh, when Urban Meyer was there. And then back the week after in Happy Valley, that most likely will be a whiteout. James Franklin did knock off the Ohio State Buckeyes, obviously, five years ago. Played them very tough when Dwayne Haskins was there. So that, that's always the potential, right? October 29th, you get back-to-back -back games against Iowa and Penn State, respectively. But is it a disappointment if this team does not make the playoffs this year? Oh, it's a massive disappointment. I, I, I think you're... You're looking at going into the season as one of the top three teams in the country in terms of talent. Uh, I don't think this is a deep Big Ten. I like the Big Ten. Uh, conference has come a long way over the past few years. I just don't think this is a really deep uh, Big Ten. They should roll through the conference uh, and into the playoffs. So anything less than that for Ryan Day after, with, after the way last year finished, I think would be a major disappointment. Uh, you know, I, I – the. Everything is in place. Uh, the offense, the changes on defense, uh, this team really should roll through the schedule again, even if there is a stumble. Iowa's an interesting choice. I, I, I like you bringing up Iowa, uh, and, and I like you bringing up Penn State. The one thing I'll say about both of those is Hawkeyes, Nittany Lions, neither team had success running the ball last year. Uh, both were under four yards per carry. Penn State, 118th in, in the country last year. So if you need to grind it out to beat Ohio State, those are two teams that are going to have to make major gains in the run game uh, to pull that off this year. Yeah, great point. And, and to your point about running the football, that's why I give Notre Dame just an opportunity to cover that 14-and-a-half point number. They don't have to win the ball game, but to cover the 14-and-a-half, I think if you're going to give a defensive-minded head coach and Marcus Freeman six months to prepare for an opponent, I like that recipe as opposed to maybe one or two weeks in terms of prep time. If anybody can devise a game plan, especially with a big top 25 battle, I would hope that it would be Marcus Freeman did not make halftime adjustments in that ball game and bowl game against Mike Gundy in the Oklahoma State offense. That cost them the opportunity to pull that ball game out. Hopefully he learned for that. So I'm leaning to Notre Dame early on. When we come back, more Big Ten. Keep it where it is. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. 
Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions. Only on Sports Grid. The Pat McAfee Show. You know, I did it once my sophomore year, but really after that North Carolina game they called, I stuck with it after that game. So you, you could take some some pride in that. Here we go. After that, after that game. I kind of stuck with it. Coach Whipple's like, you know, it doesn't have to be cold to, to rock the club. So I wore them since then on out. Uh, so, you know, it worked out well that game. It just kind of felt more comfortable. Stuck with it. I mean, I feel great. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. Let's take a look at the teams possible for Durant that at least we're hearing. And this could change too. But Phoenix is at the top because DeAndre Ayton's name has come up. The the a priori thing you have to establish here with all of these spots is does the trade leave the team capable of making the NBA Finals after the trade? And if that answer is no, Durant is not going to go. He's not going to do it. Only on Sports Grid. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Back on Football Full Circle, talking all things Big Ten. Joe Lisi, Ritz Sermonello. We discussed Ohio State being the front runners right now at minus 200 on FanDuel to win the Big Ten. They're plus 300 right now on FanDuel to win the national championship. But which team potentially, not in the East, but in the West, can challenge Ohio State right now? We have the usual suspects. We have Wisconsin and Iowa. Both teams battled last year. We saw Iowa get to the Big Ten championship, could not put up and cover that huge number against Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines. But I like a team rich in P.J. Fleck in Minnesota. They do have an experienced quarterback in Tanner Morgan. They get their star running back, Mo Ibrahim, back. This is a blue-collar, gutty defense that only allowed 17.5 points per game. Top 10 in a lot of categories, not just within the Big Ten, but within all of college football. And it's 6-1. to one. I like them to p- potentially, excuse me, steal the Big Ten West this year. Yeah, you stole my thunder a little bit because that was where <laughs> I was going to go. I, I love the Big Ten West. I, I love any division. You know, and again, not to take anything away from the East, but the East feels a little you know, scripted at this point. It would be a big surprise, although last year I thought it would have been Ohio State and Michigan won it. But looking here at the odds, um, you know, it's it's tightly packed and, and Minnesota at six to one. The big difference for me, Joe, is the addition, the uh, reintroduction of Kirk Sharaka as the offensive coordinator. Had been at Minnesota before, knows Tanner Morgan. Tanner Morgan's been just a huge mystery over the past couple of seasons. Played so well a couple of years ago. 
uh, had a breakout season for the Gophers and then has gone south over the last couple of years. So if that backfield led by Mo Ibrahim can finally stay healthy, they lost so many backs to injury last year, and Tanner Morgan can show just some hints of the way he played in 2019, I think the offense has potential. And I'm a big believer in P.J. Fleck. I, I think in terms of motivational coaches, getting more out of his team than other coaches do, he's one of the best in the country right now. But above all else, I really like this division because it's an absolute toss-up. You never know what you're going to get. Northwestern's not even listed. Last time Northwestern went three and nine under Pat Fitzgerald was 2019, and they came back a year later uh, to actually win the division at seven and two during the COVID year and, and appear in the uh, Big Ten championship game. So you can't count anybody out in the Big Ten West. No, absolutely not. I think the concern with Northwestern obviously comes to the quarterback position with Ryan Helinski, the former South Carolina quarterback that transferred over. They struggle week one, right? They were a three-point favorite against Michigan State and Kenneth Walker. He rushes for 175 on that front seven. They lose that ball game by 17 points, really set the tone for Pat Fitzgerald and the Wildcats throughout the year, limping to, like you mentioned, a 3-9 and nine record. Can they sustain that? Hunter Johnson was not the answer. Maybe Ryan Helinski could catch lightning in a bottle. Really, if they could just throw for about 200 yards per game, they'd be okay in terms of having some offensive balance. But bigger question for you, and when I look at these odds, 6-1 to one with Aiden O'Connell and Purdue and Jeff Brom, and 6-1 to one for Minnesota and P.J. Fleck with Tanner Morgan, both experienced quarterbacks. Are you shocked that they have Wisconsin uh, basically as the front runners with Paul Christ at plus 170 with a very in inconsistent quarterback in Graham Mertz, and more importantly, Nebraska and Scott Frost, who haven't been able to get it done over the last four or five seasons. I mean, their last bowl game was 2016 with Mike Riley in the Music City Bowl. I mean, how can they price them accordingly both against both teams in terms of Purdue and Minnesota that were both teams last year. Yeah, I, I mean, Wisconsin, I could see a little bit, Joe, because the track record is there. The defense is so consistent year in and year out. Jim Leonard does a great job. They've got, uh, you know, if not the best back, one of the two or three best backs in the Big Ten and Braylon Allen. Chaz Malusi, the backup. Uh, is healthy again. That one-two punch of Malusi and Allen will be uh, one of the best in the country. So Wisconsin's going to do what Wisconsin always does. And I think they're going to be uh, competitive for Paul Chris. Can, can they get over the hump uh, and win the West this year? We'll see. But in terms of, it, it's an interesting, you know, you, you brought up some interesting names during the conversation, Joe, because I, I look at this division and, and, and it really comes down to which quarterback can finally break through. Is it Graham Mertz? You know, he was a ballyhooed recruit, uh, hasn't delivered. Uh, is it Spencer Petrus from California who really needs a big senior year, especially if he's going to uh, attract the attention uh, of, of NFL scouts talking about the Iowa quarterback? Uh, Casey Thompson now is Scott Frost's new quarterback at Nebraska. Had a really nice year, an underrated year at Texas last year. Now he moves to Nebraska. And, and there's Aiden O'Connell, who is – uh, the, the most consistent, the most prolific uh, quarterback in the West. He's got a terrific offensive coach uh, in Jeff Brom. So Purdue is set at quarterback, and, and yet, you know, Purdue's kind of buried as far as the odds go out of the West. Can you win ball games? I think the bigger question, too, when you look at Iowa and you look at Wisconsin is can you, can you win ball games just running the football and relying on defense? That has been the, the cause of concern for me with Paul Christ in terms of he doesn't make second half adjustments. Uh, look at critical ball games. Notre Dame, second half, no adjustments, he gets blown out. Uh, close ball game at home against Michigan and Jim Harbaugh, doesn't make adjustments, gets blown out. Week one against James Franklin, a very close one-score game, doesn't make adjustments, winds up losing that matchup, and they limp to a 9-4 and four overall record. Can they win ball games just being able to run the football, sustain drives, being able to dictate tempo? Because the cause and the worry about Wisconsin is whenever they fall from behind, they become a one-dimensional type of team. Same like Iowa, right? When Iowa played Purdue and they trailed double digits, 
those quarterbacks in terms of Padilla and Petrus could not make enough plays to put their team back into a position to win that matchup, and that's why they lost that ball game at home. So is it possible to have an offense that's one-dimensional, running the football and relying on a very stout defense to win not just a Big Ten championship, but more importantly, a college football national championship? Well, I, I mean, listen, for Wisconsin, I, I, I think until you get better quarterback play, their potential is capped. I, I, I think in this era of football, Joe, you know, it, that applies to any school, whether it's Iowa, Wisconsin, you could look anywhere around the country. If you don't have balance, if you don't have some potency at quarterback, there's only so far you're going to go. Now, Wisconsin has used that model uh, for a lot of success. I mean, they've won a lot of football games on running the ball using their tight ends uh, in the passing game and playing really solid defense. That's been enough. But is that enough for the Wisconsin fans? Is it enough for the administration that wants to take that next step and not just be a Big Ten West contender, but actually be a legit uh, Big Ten contender and to your point, possibly compete every few years for a spot in the college football playoff. I I don't know if that's going to be enough. And again, I go back to Purdue because Purdue is the one team in that half of the Big Ten that actually has the ability uh, to pass the ball, to stretch out defenses, to utilize their wide receivers. Uh, That doesn't exist in the West. The West is very methodical. Uh, from top to bottom. And Scott Frost was supposed to make that change in Lincoln. We were supposed to see a more dynamic offense uh, with Adrian Martinez. It never happened. He was a fumbling machine uh, for the for the Cornhuskers until he finally transferred, uh, now playing this season at uh, Kansas State in the Big 12. So, you know, it's an interesting half of the, of the conference. And Purdue, that's where they have an edge with Aiden O'Connell, One thing I'll say about Purdue is they need some wide receivers to step up this year, Joe. David Bell, now a Cleveland Brown. Milton Wright, who was uh, expected to be wide receiver one in West Lafayette this year, is not going to play this year because of uh, academic suspension. So for Aiden O'Connell to play the way he did last year, finish the way he did last year in the Music City Bowl against Tennessee, he's going to need some help from his skill position players. Agreed, and there's no margin of error, Rich, in terms of their week one matchup. James Franklin and Sean Clifford go on the road in West Lafayette. The line open on FanDuel at three. It's up to three and a half. I really like the way Penn State matches up against Aiden O'Connell from a secondary perspective. Joey Porter returns, a veteran secondary, physical at the point of attack as well in terms of run support. I like Sean Clifford. Can he stay healthy? Can he lead this team for 12 games on the season? Remember, they were 5-0 and before he got hurt on the road in Iowa City. If, if he's healthy, I think there's no doubt Penn State wins that ball game by double digits against the Iowa Hawkeyes. But I like them early on as a three-and-a-half-point favorite in this matchup week one against the Purdue Boilermakers. Yeah, I do too. I, I like Penn State. I think it's a good matchup, the physicality of the Nittany Lions. And, and James Franklin wants this team to be more physical, not just defensively. Defensively, they were fine. Offensively, they've got to run the ball better. I, I mean, they have to have some kind of balance for Sean Clifford. Here's a question for you, Joe. In the state of Pennsylvania last year, we had a senior return – Uh, and use that year to elevate himself uh, to the first round of the NFL draft. Talking about Kenny Pickett, of course, from Pittsburgh. Not suggesting that Sean Clifford is Kenny Pickett, but can Sean Clifford use this final year at Penn State to elevate his stock when it comes to the NFL in 2023? I think he can. I think we're looking at maybe potentially a third or fourth round type of selection. Maybe a Kyle Trask type of compliment. Kyle Trask had a fantastic season A couple of seasons ago, he loses Jahan Dotson, but has one of the best wide receivers in the Big Ten in Parker, Washington. If they could catch some momentum early, don't count out Penn State. Right now, their win total on FanDuel is 8.5. They're plus 1,800 to win the Big Ten. That's not bad value. I like them early on. When we return, we'll talk more Big Ten football. Joe Lisi and Ritz Hermanello coming right back.
Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. The early line. If you're trading for Kevin Durant now, you're getting Kevin Durant for a few years still on the back end of his prime. Incredible stuff to drop down yesterday. Shakes the core of the NBA because it seems like, Kevin, there's four, five, or six teams now, quite honestly, if he gets traded to, go right up to the top of the standings at the FanDuel Sportsbook as the favorites to win the NBA championship. Only on SportsGrid. Sports professor Rick Carl went to the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute analyzing the Formula One deal. Amazon ran hard on getting the rights to Formula One in the U.S. ESPN, ABC, ESPN Plus ran harder. $5 million rights fee extended and expanded to anywhere from 90 to 100 depending on what you're hearing. And the bottom line is this is going to be one of those mega promotional deals that ESPN does promote all over the U.S. and the world as they justify the expansion of Formula One. So at the end of the day, Formula One viewership up 36% this year. A huge deal. The ESPN deal will keep the momentum going. And Vegas, Miami, Austin, Montreal, and other cities all over North America, the presence with Formula One bigger than anybody might have expected. Sports Professor Rick Carl, Sports News Minute. Continuing the conversation of the Big Ten West, we left off talking about Penn State and Purdue week number one. Another marquee battle takes place August 27th. It's not in the States. It's in Dublin. It's in Scott Frost in Nebraska taking on Pat Fitzgerald and the Northwestern Wildcats. This line on FanDuel opened up rich at eight and a half, immediately got bet up to 10 10 and a half, 11. And in some books around New Jersey, it's already up to 13 in favor of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. You mentioned new starting quarterback Casey Thompson does come over from Texas. He potentially is the best Nebraska quarterback. I want to say over, what, maybe the last 10 to 15 years, you want to throw in, I don't know, Adrian Martinez, Tommy Armstrong, just to name a few. I think Casey Thompson has the ability to outproduce all of those quarterbacks over the last 10 to 15 years. But more importantly, what can offensive coordinator Mark Whipple from Pittsburgh bring this team? Because all eyes are on Scott Frost and the Cornhuskers to get not only to a ball game, but to challenge for a Big Ten West title this year. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hot seat city, obviously, for Scott yeah. Frost. It, it hasn't worked out. It hasn't worked out to my expectation. I thought in the moment it was a great hire. Uh, looking back, Joe, at his career, not just at UCF, which was brief, but as an assistant coach at Oregon, 
coming home to, to Lincoln, where he was a star quarterback, a tremendous acumen. There was so much to like about this hire. It made perfect sense. And it just hasn't worked out perfectly. And, and now this year, you know, the schedule's more manageable. Um, I like this combination of KC Thompson, again, transfer quarterback from Texas. And you wisely mentioned Mark Whipple did a tremendous job with Kenny Pickett. Uh, at Pittsburgh, decided to leave. Really curious decision, right? He leaves Pittsburgh where he's inheriting Keaton Slovis, quality quarterback from USC. It's not like the cupboard was bare and decides to go to Nebraska on a staff where they could be cleaning house in a year. So obviously Mark Whipple saw something career-wise that fit what he wants to do. So I like that combination on offense. I think the offense will be better. The turnovers will be fewer. Fewer turnovers could mean more wins in those close games, which obviously Scott Frost has had a massive problem with. And then on the other side, love that this game is in Dublin. Uh, And you've got Pat Fitzgerald at three and nine, who, you know, it's his second three and nine season in the last three years. They can't score. It's absurd how bad that offense is. Can Northwestern drag Nebraska into an alley fight You know, nobody does a better job of finishing under the number than Pat Fitzgerald in Northwestern. And I think it could be that kind of a game. That game, by the way, was bet up, in my opinion, largely because of last year's blowout. Nebraska took Northwestern behind the woodshed. I think folks are looking at that game and expecting a repeat in 2022. Yeah, now the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's talk about the offense. You mentioned Mark Whipple. I will say this in terms of his first year in Pittsburgh. Kenny Pickett, very mediocre in year number one. 13 touchdowns, nine interceptions. It was a COVID year. It wasn't until the second year in Mark Whipple's scheme that he actually elevated his play. They became a more pass-heavy type of offense. So we have to see what Casey Thompson can do in year number one. There will be some growing pains. I will say this in terms of back in Scott Frost, uh, Rich, in terms of, you know, when he got there under Mike Riley, they had one of the worst statistical defenses in all of Nebraska history. They were allowing back in 2016, 2017, about 195 rushing yards per game. I mean, you never would think about the black shirts allowing close to 200 yards on the ground to opposing offenses. So there was a slow transition. But if you look at Scott Frost's tenure there, year after year, they've gotten progressively better. They were down to about 145 rushing yards per game last year. If they could take the next step, potentially this team could be an eight or a nine win football team, but they have to get over 500. They lose this ball game week number one. He might not get on the plane ride home to Lincoln because the, because of the expectations, because of the turnover of the staff, because of where this program is. Where is the marquee win under Scott Frost in, in terms of Nebraska? They did go toe-to-toe with the Big Ten champs last year in terms of Michigan. That was a Saturday night game. They lost that matchup 32-29 to in overtime. It, you know, they win that ball game. It, maybe it's a different story for the Nebraska Cornhuskers, but he's going to have to find a way to get to eight or nine wins because I don't think six wins in year number five is acceptable for the Boosters and Trev Alberts, respectively. Well, a couple of things. You bring up some excellent points. And, and I, you know, the winning is a habit. And winning becomes a part of the culture of a program. Sometimes, you know, that climb and that breakthrough really in any walk of life is, is oftentimes the most difficult thing. You know, you, you need to learn how to win. You need that muscle memory. Nebraska does not have that. Again, in, in games last year decided by 10 points or less, uh, you know, they were they did not win a game. I mean, they have been abysmal under Scott Frost. So close games, they haven't figured out how to win. This needs to be the breakthrough season. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I think they need to get, uh, I think the number is seven and a half for the season win toll. I think they need to go over. I think this needs to be an eight and four team where they build some momentum. Uh, you can get a better caliber of recruits. Uh, the culture starts to change. 
and it has to happen for all kinds of reasons. You know, I don't want to see Scott Frost being left behind in Dublin, you know, uh, uh, basically sitting in a pub for a week after, you know, Nebraska <laughs> blows it against Northwestern. That's not good for anybody. It's just a bad look across the board. Uh, and Scott's a heck of a good guy. I, I, I love the guy. I mean, he's, he's coached with some of the greats. Uh, you know, going back to the Bill Parcells, he's been around great minds his entire life. I think there's a lot of potential there. It's good for college football if Nebraska's good. And here, here's the, the thing I would raise for you, Joe. I, I, I know at some point, you know, it, it, if it doesn't get better this year, it may never get better. But my question is, if, if it doesn't work out and they're six and six or five and seven and, and they pull the plug, I'm not sure if Nebraska is in a position right now to say, okay, we know who the next guy is who's going to turn things around. Because if it's not Scott Frost at this point, I'm not sure who it's going to be to get Nebraska to where they want to be. Uh, agreed, 100%. You know, they ran Frank Solich out of town with a 9-3, and 10-2 and two overall record. That was unacceptable, unacceptable back in the day. That's how they got to Bo Pelini, right? And he sort of regressed at the end of his tenure there, gave way to Mike Riley, and I agree with you. If you can't get it done with Scott Frost, you might have to turn to maybe a younger coordinator, maybe a Mac type of head coach that, like a Mac Campbell that can come in. I'm not specifically saying Mac Campbell, but like how Mac Campbell was in Toledo to maybe potentially – turn around the program, but you got to give them time. You're going to have to give the new head coach, if Scott Frost fails this year, a good two to three years to get it done, and we'll see if the booster base will be that patient, especially when they, they handed over the reins to Frost in 2017. It's a similar situation, though, isn't it, Rich, where Jim Harbaugh was last year? Heading into, into last year, Harbaugh had to get it done against Ohio State. If they were to lose that ball game in terms of week number 14, he might not be coaching this year, right? Same situation for Scott Frost. So let's look at Michigan right now. Their win total is nine and a half. Cade McNamara returns. You also have J.J. McCarthy battling it out in terms of the one-two punch at the quarterback position. Blake Corum, a very good running back. Do we feel right here, right now, they are where they were last year in terms of the defensive talent. They lose Aiden Hutchinson. They lose about three starters from that defense last year. The schedule lines up for them to be potentially 9-3, and three, but I don't know if they're as explosive as they were last year, and they might take a slight step back in 2022. Yeah, I, I think they do. Um, now, a couple of things. One, last year was a seminal moment, not just because it was great for the fan base, winning the Big Ten Championship, beating Ohio State, getting to a playoff, all of that was magnificent uh, for Ann Arbor, any, any Michigan fan. But I do think there's going to be a residual effect from that, too. I, I think there's something about getting over the hump, realizing that you can win, realizing that your coach can exhale uh, is no longer considered to be a hot seat candidate. I think it's good for everyone associated with that program. So Michigan benefits from that perspective. Personnel-wise, I do think there's going to be a regression because not only is it the Aiden Hutchinsons and the David Ajabos, there's a lot of personnel that was lost uh, to graduation in the NFL. You lost Mike McDonald, your defensive coordinator, who I thought did a good job last year, too, back to the NFL, Jesse Minter. Uh, now will be the defensive coordinator. So there's a lot of changes on this team. I don't think they'll be as explosive uh, offensively. Um, J.J. McCarthy, you mentioned, I, I mean, I think he's one of the better backup quarterbacks in the country if, in fact, he is a backup. I mean, I, I think there's a chance that he unseats Cade McNamara, who is an average quarterback, in my opinion. So I, I think Michigan will be good. They'll be solid, but they'll be more vulnerable than they were last year. Nine and a half, you said, Joe, was the number? Yeah. Nine, yeah, and, nine and a half, half in feels, the schedule. Feels a little the high schedule. to me. I, I think I think they top off at nine and three. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this is not going to be the same Michigan team as last year, but I still think they'll be forging ahead. The recruits have been better. Look for Will Johnson, true freshman cornerback, right out of the gate to be uh, one of the top rookies in the country this year. Well, the schedule lines up, and so I agree with you. I think it's a potential nine-win football team. I'm going to go through the first six games before they play Penn State, Rich. Colorado State at home, 
Hawaii at home, UConn at home, Maryland at home, and then they go on the road October 1st to face Iowa, and then on the road in Bloomington to face Indiana. So I think we're in agreement 6-0 and before they face off and square off in Ann, in Ann Arbor against Sean Clifford and the Penn State and Indy Lions, followed by Michigan State and Mel Tucker, then Rutgers, then Nebraska. So that's going to be really the make it or break it part of their schedule. Can they navigate through with only maybe one loss in terms of Penn State, Michigan State, and Nebraska before they end their year with Ohio State in Columbus? Can I give you one that might be a potential landmine? If Michigan sure. regresses at all this year, there's one team that I think is intriguing, not because they can win the Big Ten East, but Maryland's offense, led by uh, Talia Tungabaloa and that wide receiver core, is going to be dangerous. I, I think Maryland, not a big Mike Loxley fan. Yeah, they went 7-6 and six last year. Defense will be average. But that offense alone, if they catch fire on a particular weekend, that's the kind of squad that can knock off a of Michigan, even – you know, even at the big house when they least expect it. So that Maryland game, as Michigan is kind of cruising along, that early part of the schedule is just tissue soft. But watch the Terrapins this year. That offense is going to be a lot of fun to watch. They started 4-1 and one last year. They knocked off Jared Dagey in West Virginia, and then they fell off a cliff. They got abused by Michigan, Michigan State respectively, bounced back with two late season, season wins against Indiana and Rutgers, and they did dominate Virginia Tech in the bowl game. The one thing I haven't seen in terms of Mike Loxley's teams, discipline, especially on the offensive side of the ball. They take a ton of penalties in major ball games that handcuffs this team. If they could clean that up, I agree with Rich. Not only are they a bowl team, but potentially they could be a nine-win football team in 2022. We're coming right back. Keep it where it is. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. The early line. For two Pac-12 teams on the West Coast to be in the Big Ten, it doesn't even compute or make any sense until you remember it's about the almighty dollar. So now, where does that leave the Pac-12 at this point? Your two flagship programs now are in the Big Ten. You're going to fold up. There is no more Power Five. We are at best a Power Four. At best, at best a Power Four. Because the Pac-12 is done. Only on Sports Grid. The morning after. The Big Ten was looking at deals that would pay them out $1.1 billion with a B on an annual basis. That was before USC and UCLA joined the conference for 2024 yesterday. And I think it could potentially top $3 billion. I really believe that once we get started in 2024, Ben, because you're talking about some of the most recognizable names in terms of the sport. The Sports Grid Network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. 
The Pat McAfee Show. It's better to be in your skate than it is your sneakers because you don't your your foot's going like this, right? It's it, it immobilizes your foot in your boot. It's a cast. I'm like, oh, this dude's good to go. And we're watching him in warmups, trying to get a feel. This guy's flying around like nothing. I mean, he's he's for sure. I, I've been told there's like at least five or six guys that have broken feet. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that's like. It's nuts, man. They're blocking shots. The Sports Grid Network. We left off talking about the Big Ten West. We talked about Nebraska. You talk about Nebraska and Northwestern, Rich, that square off in week number one. Both teams ended their 2021 campaigns on six-game losing streaks. They were both 1-8 within the Big Ten last year. Hopefully they can get a start with a victory week number one, August 27th in Dublin. But a team we didn't talk about in last segment, the Illini. And, and Brett Bielma in year number two, they were 4-5 and five Within the conference, obviously, their marquee win came late in the year in nine overtimes in Happy Valley against James Franklin and the Penn State Nittany Lions. Brandon Peters returns. Can Brett Bielma potentially get this team to a bowl game in year number two? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly possible, Joe, based on what I saw last year in his uh, debut in Champaign. It, to, to get a Brett Bielema who spent so many years, so many successful years at Wisconsin, you know, was up and down, had a rough time at Arkansas in the SEC, but this is a veteran coach. He knows how to coach. He has a system that has worked in the past, and he's going to try to bring that Wisconsin system to Illinois, which basically means solid, no-nonsense defense, the ability to run the ball, big physical offensive lines. He's a big physical offensive lineman back in uh, his playing days at Iowa, and that's what he wants at, at Illinois. And I think in the Big Ten West, it can work. He's got a talented running back in Chase Brown. The defense made major strides last year without a lot of marquee names. So I think I'm I'm bullish on Illinois potentially getting to that six and six point. If the next step is to get to a bowl game, uh, show some improvement. I think that's real pro- uh, positive for Brett Bielema with the Illini. They are thirty to one right now on FanDuel to potentially steal the Big Ten West. That's great value heading into the season. Rich and I still like Purdue and Minnesota respectively, so we'll see how it plays out. When we come back in next hour, we'll be talking about the best conference in college football, the SEC, baby. Keep it where it is. 